Hey Future Unnaturalists, I'm Emily. And I'm Andy. And we are the hosts of Unnatural, a true crime podcast. Each week, we'll dive into some of the most unnerving crimes that this unnatural world has to offer. Listen for Unnatural on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, make good choices. And don't get got. Bye. I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. It's been a minute, right? I know. I had the busiest month of October, but like, I told you guys I was going to be gone for a minute. I had a bunch of concerts this month. I had a book signing. Have you guys seen my book yet? It's on Amazon still, and um, there's also an ebook. I'm also in a play. I'm performing in a musical about Jack the Ripper. So yeah, this was a busy-ass month for me. But anyway, now we're in November, which means it's my birthday month. I'm hoping to go back to doing an episode a week this month, though don't hold me to that. Remember, you can get access to my new episodes early by subscribing to my Patreon. For as low as $1 a month, you can get new episodes two days early while supporting me and my podcasts. And speaking of which, we do have a new Patreon, James Harrington. Thank you so much for your support. So with that said, let's get on with this. This episode is about Phil Hartman. Phil Hartman was an actor and comedian who was known for a lot of work. He did voiceovers for The Simpsons. He impersonated more than 50 characters on Saturday Night Live. Like, he impersonated Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan and John Wayne. Sadly, the reason we're talking about him is because he was murdered in a murder-suicide by his wife, Bryn. Phil Hartman was born on September 24th, 1948 in Brantford, Ontario, Canada. He was the fourth of eight children and says that he found affection difficult to earn as a child. He said, I suppose I didn't get what I wanted out of my family life, so I started seeking love and attention elsewhere. Phil's family moved to the United States when Phil was 10 years old, settling in Los Angeles, California. Here's a fun fact. Phil Hartman attended Orville Wright Junior High School, where he had a classmate named Lynette Fromm. Lynette Fromm is also known as Squeaky Fromm, who you may remember was a member of the Manson family. Squeaky Fromm also attempted to assassinate President Gerald Ford and served approximately 34 years in prison before being released on parole in 2009. Phil Hartman was known for being a class clown growing up. He attended the Santa Monica City College and studied art, but he dropped out in 1969 to become a roadie for a band called The Rock and Foo. When Phil was 20, he met a beautiful 19-year-old named Gretchen Lewis. Gretchen was said to have opened up worlds for him sexually. I no longer have any sex hang-up, which had built up and was beginning to flip me out, Hartman wrote. My hang-up was that I'd never met a girlfriend who digs sex as much as me. Well, I've met my match. The feeling was mutual. According to Gretchen, things went from a sexual standpoint that I didn't even know existed before. Just from the point of pure duration, I was a living bladder infection. Unfortunately, the chemistry would fade pretty quickly, and the couple would divorce in 1972 after less than two years of marriage. Phil's close friend and lawyer, Steve Small, said, Phil fell in love easily, but wasn't very skilled at continuing a relationship. In 1972, Phil returned to school for graphic arts. He stopped working as a roadie and started working for his brother's talent management agency. He kind of developed his own graphic art business using his skills from college and began designing album covers for classic rock bands. He created more than 40 album covers, doing promotional work for Crosby, Stills & Nash and also Buffalo Springfield, which I guess is almost the same thing, and designing the cover art for America's album, History, America's Greatest Hits, and also for Poco's Legend album. By 1975, Phil had grown tired of graphic design and he felt the urge to do something a little bit more social. He was a little bit introverted despite his comedic nature, so he was trying to be more extroverted and get out of his shell. He attended a comedy show by the Los Angeles improv group, The Groundlings. The Groundlings are a famous comedy troupe as well as like a a training program. Members would audition and they would have to be accepted into the program in order to perform with them. And then they would like train with them and like take lessons with them. A lot of really big names were Groundlings like Lisa Kudrow, John Lovitz, Kathy Griffin, Will Ferrell, and the list just goes on and on and on. Maya Rudolph too. 
Their shows would often include inviting audience members onto the stage, and Phil, who was attempting to be more extroverted, volunteered. Tracy Newman, a founding member of the Groundlings, said, I never saw an audience member come up with that kind of excitement and energy. It was like a hurricane hit that stage, and I mean it in a good way. Phil was invited to join their troupe, meaning he would enroll in training and performing with them without having to audition. For years, he paid his way through the training by helping with the group's graphic design needs, like redesigning their logo and their merchandise. Phil made his first appearance on television in the late 70s when he appeared on an episode of The Dating Game. He was actually the winner, but for some reason, his date stood him up. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Like, why, why even go on the show? During his time with the Groundlings, Phil befriended Paul Rubens, and together they created the character Pee Wee Herman and developed the Pee Wee Herman show, which began as a live stage show. Phil played the character Captain Carl and reprised the role for the children's TV show Pee Wee's Playhouse. He also co-wrote the script of the 1985 film Pee Wee's Big Adventure. By this time, Phil was 36 years old and considering quitting acting. He was having a hard time finding work, but then he saw the huge success that came from Pee Wee's Big Adventure and changed his mind. He got small roles in films like Jumpin' Jack Flash and The Three Amigos, and he did quite a bit of voiceover work in animated television shows like The Smurfs, The 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, and Dennis the Menace. At some point, Phil developed an affinity for guns, and, um... He was dating Donna Kaufman, who would become a writer for SNL and Mad TV, and he offered to show her his gun collection. She thought he was joking until he pulled out a Colt 45. She said he was really delighted about it, bragging. In 1982, Phil would marry his second wife, Lisa Strain. I believe she is now known as Lisa Strain Jarvis. And this marriage followed patterns similar to the first. The couple had wild sex and intense chemistry in the very beginning. Lisa was like a hot little firecracker with a high sex drive, and she was very, very supportive of his career. Phil was really into it at first, but eventually his libido would kind of fade while hers remained high. According to Lisa, he was also reclusive and would disappear emotionally, often going into his own world. On 2020, Lisa had said, My sense of Phil was that he was really two people. He was the guy who wanted to draw and write and think and create and come up with ideas. He was the actor, the entertainer, and then he was the recluse. She continued, Seeing Phil at the Groundlings was Phil being truly Phil. You know, as time goes by, you understand that his personas are his protection and are his personality. Sadly, after about a year of marriage, Lisa realized that the relationship was over. She says, On our first anniversary, we went back to Santa Barbara and I dressed up, lingerie or something, and I jumped up on the bed. And he said, Must you? Really? So I said, No. I took it off, put a robe on, got my book out, and I knew that was the end. Before long, the couple would divorce and Hartman would meet his next wife, Bryn Omdahl. Bryn was tall and blonde and a sometimes model. She grew up in Minnesota doing some modeling work and moved to L.A. with hopes of becoming an actress. She was a year into recovery when she met Phil, having struggled with alcoholism and cocaine addiction. She enjoyed going to the Rodeo meetings in Beverly Hills, where she could sometimes run into celebrities. Phil fell deeply, deeply in love with Bryn right from the beginning, despite his friends believing that they weren't a good match. In 1986, Phil earned his spot on the variety show Saturday Night Live in its 12th season. He joined a cast that included John Lovitz, Dana Carvey, and Kevin Nealon. During this time, he played a wide range of characters and became well-known for his impressions. He performed as over 70 different characters, including Johnny Cash, Frank Sinatra, Ed McMahon, Bill Clinton, Jesus, and so on. He had a nickname on SNL, which was The Glue. Lauren Michaels, who was an SNL creator, said, He kind of held the show together. He gave to everybody and demanded very little. He was very low maintenance. He also added that Hartman was the least appreciated cast member by commentators outside the show and praised his ability to do five or six parts in a show where you're playing support or you're doing remarkable character work. See, he was very much like a supporting character who contributed so much to the scenes, but maybe because he was supporting, people didn't praise him as much. But he absolutely deserved all the praise. And his castmates on SNL recognized that. Phil and Bryn were fighting a lot. Bryn was beginning to feel kind of jealous, probably a little bit left out too, because her career wasn't advancing like Phil's was. Plus, Phil was so emotionally, 
closed off that when they would get into fights, he would shut down and refuse to engage, sometimes just locking himself into a room, leaving her to feel hopeless of any resolution of the argument. And it became evident to everybody that the two of them were fighting. I mean, it was hostile between them. Chris Rock recalled how any time they were together, like on set, they were fighting and it was absolutely uncomfortable to be around. They would make friends with plans. <laughs> they would make plans with friends and end up bailing on them because they would be at home fighting. Bryn would sometimes time their arguments right before like crucial performances or dress rehearsals for SNL, which is really fucking manipulative. Marta Kaufman recalls that Bryn visited the set one day when the cast and the writers were gathered in a conference room. She says, She comes in and starts sitting on all the guys' laps and kissing them and putting her tongue in their ears, and everyone thought, Oh, isn't that funny? And I thought, How could she do this to Phil? This is so humiliating to him. And he's lounging like he didn't care. How could you not care? Phil remained close with his ex-wife, Lisa, and he confided in her about the fights he had with Bryn. He vented about how Bryn needed constant validation and wanted a lot of plastic surgery. He told her she had a lot of insecurities around his fame. You can actually see her in the opening credits of Saturday Night Live with Phil, but it's just like the back of her head. So if you look closely, while they're showing Phil, you can see next to him a blonde woman, and you can see her earring, it's swinging as if she just turned her head really fast. So that's Bryn, and what's happening is she was trying to show her face to the camera, but the director kept making her turn away. So that earring swinging was her turning her head away from the camera real quick. Phil told Lisa that Bryn was becoming increasingly jealous, even about silly things like fan mail. She would throw violent tantrums, like literally start throwing shit at him. She also suspected that Hartman was having an affair, which was incorrect. He was not. They tried marriage counseling, but Phil often didn't show up. He grew distant and began to reject his wife in the bedroom. The pair broke up for a short period, but in 1987, while SNL was on a break, Phil returned to L.A. to see her and they got back together. Shortly after, she moved in with him in New York City, which was concerning to his friends. Phil had a good friend, Cassandra Peterson, who was a fellow groundling. She's also known famously for playing the character Elvira. So she was set to appear on SNL's Halloween episode and dropped by Phil's office to say hello. Phil showed her the engagement ring that he had bought for Bryn, and Cassandra blurted out, Oh, God, no. Phil was really, really hurt by that reaction, and he told her to get out of his office. She did acknowledge later that that was rude of her, and she should not have reacted like that. It was just like her instant reaction. But either way, this soured their relationship, and their friendship ended for a time. Phil proposed to Bryn in October 1987, and they were married soon after, on November 25th, 1987. In June 1988, they had their first child, a son named Sean. Phil called up his ex-wife Lisa and told her that he had just become a father. So Lisa wrote a card to Phil and Bryn saying something like, Much love from Aunt Lisa if you ever need a babysitter, and I'm so thrilled for you. So according to Lisa... Bryn wrote me back four pages of the most hideous vitriol you could imagine. Bryn threatened her life and told her in the letter that if she ever came near her child, she would kill her. And if she ever came near her husband, she would rip her eyes out. And they had never even met. So Lisa called Phil and said, do you have any idea who you're married to? And like, he, she told him about the letter and Phil said, you should have seen the letter she wanted to send. In other words, he actually talked her down. So, like, imagine what fucking letter she had originally written before he talked her down. Needless to say, Lisa was pissed and their friendship was also over. Also, Lisa learned at some point that Phil had told Bryn that she wasn't actually his soulmate, but Lisa was. So, I don't know, maybe Bryn had a reason to be a little bit jealous. Not enough to threaten her life and everything, but um, it makes it makes me wonder if Phil was actually doing things to like that fucked with her head. In 1990, Phil Hartman made his debut on The Simpsons as the character Lionel Hutz. In 91, he debuted another character on the show, Troy McClure. His marriage continued to suffer. Nonetheless, they had a second child in February 1992, a daughter named Bergen. By 1993, almost every cast member from his first year on SNL had left the show. 
He said that he felt like an athlete who's watched all his World Series teammates get traded off in other directions. He said, it was hard to watch them leave because I sort of felt like we're all part of the team that saved the show. The cast turnover resulted in newer performers like Adam Sandler, Chris Farley, and David Spade, who were all in about their 20s. Phil was close with these cast members and he took them under his wing, particularly Chris Farley, but he felt that his style of humor didn't fit in with these newer cast members and he decided to leave the show in 1994. He started working on his own variety show, The Phil Show, but it wasn't picked up. So in 1995, he signed on to an NBC sitcom called News Radio alongside Andy Dick, where he starred as a news anchor named Bill McNeil. The show ran for four seasons and would be renewed for a fifth season, but sadly, Phil died before the production began for the fifth season. He was also landing parts in movies like Jingle All the Way with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sergeant Bilko with Steve Martin. Meanwhile, Bryn was getting very little work. She had one line in a Rob Reiner movie called North, where she played a cocktail waitress, and she also appeared in an episode of Third Rock from the Sun as an alien from Venus. By all accounts, she was really hoping for more work. By 1996, their marriage was deteriorating. Phil's libido was, again, low. The couple wasn't having sex, and a friend of Phil's recalls a story that Phil told him, where a female neighbor came over and Phil said to Bryn, she has great tits. Bryn became increasingly paranoid that Phil was cheating on her and even started to worry when he was with his male friend, suspecting that maybe he was having a homosexual affair. He wasn't. But he did spend a lot of time away from home hanging out with friends or spending all his time on his boat or his plane. In 1987, Bryn relapsed on cocaine and began drinking soon after. On Mother's Day, Bryn went out partying and came home in the early hours the next morning, completely plastered. Phil and Bryn got into an argument, and he told her that she needed to go back to rehab. So she checked into a facility, but it was short-lived. She left and returned home after four or five days. Some reports said that she left because she was missing her kids, while others said that she simply decided she was better or she could handle it on her own. Nonetheless, she continued down a spiral of drug and alcohol abuse. Phil told his mother that he was out of his mind with concern about Bryn, and he said that he told her that if she was ever in that state again, he would take the kids and leave. It's odd, though. It seems like he didn't understand the seriousness of drug addiction. I mean, he was aware that she was addicted and had a problem, but it seems as though he really, really thought she would eventually pull herself together. In December 1987, Phil and Bryn hosted a New Year's Eve party, and Andy Dick was there. Bryn reportedly approached Andy Dick and asked him if he had cocaine. Of course, it's Andy Dick, so he had cocaine and he was happy to share it. In fact, he was probably like, I'm offended you asked. Of course I have cocaine. So Bryn and Andy locked themselves in a room and did a bunch of coke that night. Phil was very hurt and very upset. And a lot of people blame Andy Dick for participating in Bryn's relapse. In fact, John Lovitz ran into him sometime a few years later and, like, to his face, said something to him about being responsible for Bryn's relapse. But Andy Dick says it's not his fault. He said she was already in relapse mode, which I didn't even know she had a problem at all in the first place. So he's saying, like, nobody nobody fucking told him that she was recovering or anything, and, like, she just came up and asked him for coke. And to be fair, I mean, it probably wasn't wise to have Andy Dick and Bryn at a party together. Like, when your friend or loved one is in recovery, you shouldn't carelessly invite triggers into their home like that. Again, I think Phil just didn't understand the seriousness of the addiction. Bryn's mood swings grew increasingly unpredictable. She was prescribed Zoloft, but it didn't seem to be helping. But it's possible that that's because she was mixing it with alcohol. Phil had confided to a couple of co-stars from news radio about his, his problems with Bryn, after he came to the set with scratches on his face. Another time he showed up looking completely disheveled because he had spent the night sleeping on his boat after a fight with her. He also confided in Lisa, his ex-wife, who was concerned because Bryn owned a gun. Phil, again, wasn't too worried. In April 1998, Bryn turned 40 years old. She was worried about getting older and looking older. In an effort to placate her, he offered to pass around a screenplay that she had written to his colleagues and agents, and and he was reluctant because it wasn't very good, but he really loved her and he really wanted to make her happy. So he just, like, passed it around, like, come on, can you just please read this so you can say that you read this, you know? 
By this time, Phil had mended his friendship with Cassandra Peterson, a.k.a. Elvira. They had a phone conversation that got pretty deep. He told her, If I died tomorrow, I would know that I had a better life than anyone could have ever dreamed of having. It has so far outweighed my expectations. I've got a beautiful wife, two beautiful children. I'm the luckiest man alive. On May 27, 1998, Phil spent the afternoon having lunch and looking at boats with a friend. Around 6 p.m., he returned home where Bryn was with the nanny and the kids. He told Bryn that he was going back out to go see his plane at the Van Nuys airport, but he wouldn't be long. After he left, she decided that she was going out too, so she told the nanny that she was going out for drinks with a friend at Buca de Beppo. Shortly after she left, Phil came home and he sent the nanny home. At Buca de Peppo, Bryn met her friend Christine Zander. They sat at the bar where Bryn had two Cosmos and half a beer, and it was said that she nursed these drinks over about two and a half hours. According to Christine, Bryn didn't seem drunk. At about 9 p.m., Christine decided to call it a night, but Bryn didn't seem to be ready to end the night there. Before they paid the bill, Bryn went to use the phone at the restaurant. Remember, it's the 90s, so it was probably like a payphone by the bathroom. So she called her old friend, Ron Douglas, who she dated about 15 years prior and had remained friends with. Phil knew about Ron, and he had no problem with their friendship, as long as they didn't stay out late together because the pair used to do a lot of coke together. At about 10.15 p.m., Bryn arrived at Ron's home in Studio City. They drank beer and talked about Bryn's script, and Bryn vented about Phil having spent the whole day with his friend. She told him that Phil made her feel like dirt and complained that he smoked a lot of weed and that he was constantly out of it. Over the next couple hours, she had about three more beers, and at 12.36 a.m., Bryn used the phone to call another friend, Susan, who she also used to do coke with. So clearly, Bryn was looking to score, but Susan didn't answer. So at 12.45, Bryn said her goodbyes and headed home. Or so she said. Ron told her to call him when she got home to let him know that she made it there safely, but she never did. What exactly transpired over the next three hours is unclear. At some point, Bryn returned home and crept into her bedroom where Phil was sleeping. On the closet shelf was a metal lockbox where she and Phil kept their firearms and gun supplies. She grabbed Phil's Smith & Wesson 38 and walked over to the bed. From her side of the bed, standing about 18 inches away from Phil, she aimed the gun at him and fired into the side of his neck. She fired a second shot that entered into his forearm and exited through the other side and then re-entered into his chest. The final shot was the most damaging. She fired at point-blank or nearly point-blank range into the middle of his forehead just above the bridge of his nose, passing through his skull and into his brain. His death was quick, if not instantaneous. It looked as though he was smiling in his sleep, like maybe he was in the middle of a dream. Around 3.25 a.m., Bryn called Ron on the phone and told him that Phil wasn't home. But he left a note saying, I'm going out for the night, I'll be back. Phil, love you. She told Ron that she didn't want to be alone and asked if she could go back over to his house. But he told her that she should just try to go back to sleep. It was late and she couldn't leave her kids unsupervised. So, so he suggested that she have a glass of milk and some aspirin and just go lay back down. And by this point, he's irritated because the woman won't let him sleep and she keeps calling him up, so he does the same thing. 20 minutes later, Bryn comes back and is banging on his door, ringing the doorbell over and over again. So he gets up pissed and answers the door, and Bryn is standing there in her pajamas with socks on but no shoes. Her breath reeked like alcohol, and it was clear to him that she was completely fucked up, drunk, and probably on drugs. He was clearly irritated with her, and she stumbled inside the house saying, Don't yell at me. Phil yells at me all the time. Once she was inside, she tried to sit on the living room sofa, but she slid off onto the floor. She was sobbing, and she blurted something out about having killed Phil or killing Phil. Ron didn't think much of it because he thought she was just being hysterical and was just venting about another fight she had with her husband. While she's sitting on the floor, she is continuously dozing off, and she tells Ron that her stomach hurts and she's sick, and then she passes out. He gets nervous because he doesn't know, like, what she's on, so he decides to keep her awake until she sobers up, just to be safe. When he manages to wake her, she runs to the bathroom and vomits. And this happens several times. She comes back to sit down, she passes out, he wakes her up, she goes and vomits, and comes back and passes out. So he got her some water and some hot tea, and Bryn asked Ron to call her house. And he did several times, but there was no answer, and he didn't leave any messages. 
At one point during one of these phone calls, Bryn started rummaging through her purse, and suddenly the gun tumbled out onto the floor. Ron was shocked and was like, what are you doing with that? So Bryn doesn't say anything. She just picks the gun up. So he says, give it to me, and she hands it over. Ron opened up the gun cylinder, and he saw that there appeared to be six cartridges in the chambers, which he assumes means that no, bu- no bullets had been fired. But he's wrong. There aren't actually six bullets in it. I don't under- I don't, I'm not really quite sure why he thinks there are. So Bryn says, see, I told you I killed Phil. But he remained doubtful, and he just, like, put the gun in a kitchen drawer. Around 6 a.m., so just a couple hours later, Ron decided that she was sober enough to drive home. But she insisted that he follow her back in his own car to make sure that she made it safely. On the way out of his house, he grabbed the gun again and looked in the cylinder a second time. And this time he noticed that there weren't six bullets in the chamber. There were only three. So he got nervous at this point, but he was like hopeful, like maybe she just shot a couple of warning shots into the air or something. So he puts the gun into a plastic grocery bag and he put it in the trunk of his car. So they start driving to Phil and Bryn's home, and on the way, Bryn is driving like an absolute maniac. Like, she's speeding and not staying in the lanes, and she's blowing stoplights. And she picks up the car phone and calls her friend Judy. She was sobbing and screaming, and she said, I think I killed Phil. Judy was like, where are you? And she said, I don't know. I don't know. My life is over. So Judy starts asking her to read off some of the signs, and she figures out that she's not far from home, so... Judy hangs up the phone, gets dressed, and drives over to Phil's home, to Phil and Bryn's home. Bryn pulled into her driveway with Ron pulling up behind her. They ran straight to the master bedroom where they found Phil's lifeless body in bed. That's when the reality hit Ron like a ton of bricks. Bryn said, oh my god, he's dead. I told you. I told you I did. I told you I killed him. I killed him. I don't know why. Bryn then picks up the phone and calls her friend Steve and Marcy, and she also tells them that she killed Phil. So she's just picking up the phone and calling everybody to tell them. Ron is freaking out. So he steps out into the hallway and he calls 911. He's holding the gun in a plastic bag and he wants nothing more than to just get out of this fucking nightmare. While he's on the phone with the police, Bryn goes into the bedroom with Phil's body and locks herself in. Ron tried to get in, but he was unsuccessful. Now, remember, the gun that Ron has in his hand is the gun that Bryn used to shoot Phil. That wasn't Bryn's gun. That was Phil's gun. So... Bryn's gun is still in the bedroom, where she has just locked herself. So Bryn is screaming and wailing from the bedroom, and somehow the kids, who were six and nine, are sleeping through it all. From the bedroom, Bryn picked up the phone and called her sister, Kathy, and she told her that she killed Phil. She asked her to tell the children that she loves them, and Kathy was freaking out, but Bryn just hung up on her. Then, at 6.32 a.m., Bryn's phone started ringing. She answered it, and it was the police. She says, hello, and they say, hi, this is the police department. Is Ronnie home? And she says, yes, come in. And they ask her, is there someone who's been shot there? And she says, yes. And they say, how many people are inside the house? Bryn says, help me. Crying, she hangs up. They call back and they say, ma'am, how many people are inside the house right now? She says, I don't know. They say, okay, thank you. And this time it's the police who drops the call. Steve and Marcy arrive at the home, but they're not able to get in. So they buzz in from the gate. And they tried calling Bren on her cell phone, but she was completely incoherent. So they're looking through the windows and they can see Ron inside. And none of these people know each other. So they're all looking at each other like, who are you and what are you doing here? But they all end up figuring out that they're all there to help with whatever the fuck is happening with Bren and Phil. So Steve and Marcy ask Ron to let them in, but the gate was locked with a deadbolt, meaning they couldn't open it without a key. So not only were Steve and Marcy unable to get into the house, Ron was trapped inside and unable to get out. So he goes into the bedroom to get the nine-year-old boy, Sean, and he woke him up and told him that they needed to get out of the house. Fortunately, Sean knew where his parents kept the key to the, to the gate. So they were able to get outside, and the police were just arriving at this point. So Ron passes over the boy and the gun to the police, and he tells them that there's still a six-year-old girl inside the house, might be sleeping, she's in her bedroom. Bryn picks up the phone and calls her sister, Kathy, again. She says, take care of my children. Kathy's like, what do you mean? And she says, just let them know how much I love them. She was sobbing and completely inconsolable. She says, tell mom. And at that point, she hears the police coming up the stairs and she's like, I gotta go. So like the police are literally like on their way up the stairs looking for her. And she just hangs up the phone. She goes to her closet and gets her own gun from the safe. She climbed into bed with Phil, sat up, 
inserted the barrel into her mouth and squeezed the trigger. The bullet passed through her brain and lodged into the headboard. Her head slumped down toward Phil and her shooting hand dropped to her right, almost touching him, with her finger still on the trigger. The responding officers heard the single gunshot at about 6.38 a.m., but they couldn't be certain of its origin or its target. So the response team went and cleared all the other bedrooms, including Bergen's. Two of the officers went outside and set up outside of uh, Bryn's bedroom window and the curtains were drawn, while another officer was running towards the bedroom from the inside of the house. The lead officer shouted, Los Angeles Police Department, come out with your hands up. But there was no response. So one of the officers outside grabbed a brick that he found and he hurled it through the window. And at the same time, the officer inside the house forces his way through the, the door. It was at this point that they found both bodies covered in blood in the bed, and it was too late. The two children, Sean and Bergen, were escorted away in their pajamas to a police station for questioning. The children suffered no physical injuries, but were understandably distraught. The time of death for Phil Hartman was unclear, but it was pretty clear that by the time the police and everybody showed up at about 6.20, 6.30 in the morning, Phil had already been dead for a few hours. So here's... What I'm curious about, I'm curious to figure out what time this all happened, because let's go over this again. 1245 in the morning, Bryn had just called her friend Susan, probably trying to get some coke. And then she leaves Ron's house. He's like, call me when you get home. And she never does. So we don't know exactly if she goes home or if she goes somewhere else. Then at 325, she calls Ron and she tells him, hey, Phil's not home. He left a note. Can I come back over? And he's like, no, what the fuck? You can't leave your kids alone. So what I'm trying to understand is when she made that phone call, she shows up to Ron's house 20 minutes later, freaking the fuck out. But during the phone call, she didn't seem distraught. So could she have made that phone call and then killed Phil? Like maybe she wasn't actually planning on leaving her kids home alone because Phil was alive. So I don't know. I'm curious. Maybe she went out and party during those three hours, got really fucked up, came home and... Maybe she tried to have sex with Phil. Maybe they got into, like, the impression is people believe that they got into an argument and she killed him. Who knows? Who knows what happened? Some people believe she was killed. He was killed, like, at one in the morning or two in the morning. And I'm kind of wondering if it was in between that phone call and her actually showing up at Ron's house. It's unclear. Steve Small, who I had mentioned earlier, he was an attorney and a friend of Phil's. He said about Bryn, she had trouble controlling her anger. She got attention by losing her temper adding that the two had separated more than once. Apparently, Phil told him that he actually had to restrain her at times. Although there was a lot of, like, talk and rumors about domestic abuse, police said that they were unaware of any previous visits to their house. Another friend of the couple's, Andrea Diamond, said, There were rumors, but you should have seen how he used to look at her. You could tell he loved her. I don't know why she would do this to the kids. And it seems like, by all accounts... Bryn was a great mother and was very devoted. It seems like maybe she was just getting lonely and fed up with her husband not coming home, not spending time with the family and not spending any time with her. And I don't think she would have done this to the kids if not for the drugs. Lisa Strain, remember, that's uh, Phil's ex-wife, was completely shocked when she heard about the deaths. She said he always talked about his children and how he and Bryn were working it out. A ceremony was held for both Bryn and Phil in Forest Lawn Cemetery in Los Angeles, California, which has a lot of celebrities in it. Phil's brother, John Hartman, took the high road and addressed the elephant in the room directly. He implored everyone not to think of Bryn as a killer. He said, They were victims of the same accident. There's no one to hate and no blame to be laid. I beg you to forgive her. So put this incident in your past and close the door. Forget if you can. So remember how I mentioned that Bryn had been taking Zoloft, but she was also like drinking and doing drugs on it? Well, in 1999, Bryn's brother Greg sued the Zoloft manufacturer Pfizer for wrongful death on behalf of the children in both estates. Pfizer gave a statement that there's no scientific or medical evidence that Zoloft causes violent or suicidal behaviors. And the suit was settled for $100,000, though there was no admission of any wrongdoing. Bryn's sister Kathy and her husband raised both children in the Midwest. They got everything in their parents' will, and they grew up to be very loved. Sean is now 34 years old and pursuing his dreams of being an artist and a musician. Phil used to brag that Sean's talent far exceeded his own. Bergen is now 30 and married and running her own business, 
and she's said to have her father's gift for comedy. Bryn's brother, Greg Omdahl, said, I believe my sister would be very proud of how Sean and Bergen have grown up and the people they've turned into. Phil Hartman was also very active in the community, participating in causes like Heal the Bay to Restore the Santa Monica Bay and the Museum of Flying in, in Santa Monica. He also served as honorary sheriff of Encino. So that's the tragic story of the death of Phil Hartman and also his wife, Bryn. I honestly don't think Bryn was a bad person. I think that both of them had maybe a, a an erratic, toxic relationship. Seemed they really, really loved each other and lived loved their children. But, you know, Phil was especially not present and Bryn was especially needy. I think she needed a lot of extra support because of her mental health and her drug addiction. And a lot of times those things fuel each other. It's a lonely, lonely hole to fall into. Don't forget to check out BrokenLimelight.com. You can find a transcript-ish of this episode as well as like pictures and videos. I went ahead and I posted some videos of Phil, Car- uh, Phil Hartman doing impressions from SNL and also like his audition tapes. Also, please do me a big, big favor and subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already. I'm under Dee Dee West, really easy to find. You can find all of the Broken Limelight episodes there as well as like my TikTok teasers. There's performance clips from like the shows that I do, my singing and the plays and everything. And of course, follow me on social media. Just look up Dee Dee West on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, Patreon. And I'm also on Facebook under Broken Limelight. All right, that's it. Thank you. Bye. Bark box, bark box, bark box, bark box. You guys know my dogs, Jude and Eleanor Rigby. Well, we just started getting a bark box, and I'm telling you, your dogs will love you. No more are they angry at the mailman. No more, I say. It's like a box of dog joy that's delivered every month, and each box tells a different story with different themed toys, treats, and photo-worthy props. Typically, what we get in each box is a couple of toys, a couple of treats, and a chew, but you can actually tailor fit your box to fit your dog's needs. Guys, I'm telling you, your dogs will love you, even more than they already do. So try it out, and if you use my link, you'll get a free extra month of BarkBox, which is a $35 value. So just head to BarkBox.com slash Broken Limelight and get started on your first BarkBox today. BarkBox, 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 BarkBox. Nailed it, Jude.